Okay, uh, it was probably happened in a couple of steps. So when I graduated, I didn't want an engineering job. I actually tried to start my own company. And so I was, um, the reason I got into engineering is I loved audio. And I thought, wouldn't it be cool if I could design my own effects pedals and PA systems and stuff like that. While I was actually going through my engineering degree, I did custom design work for recording studios and musicians. So I thought I'd just keep trying that when I graduated. That lasted a good six months because um, I worked really hard and ended up with almost no money. <laughs> and although I didn't have a business degree, it wasn't hard to figure out that that wasn't going to be a sustainable business model. Um, I then did six months of overseas volunteer aid work in Pakistan, helping people to um, uh, put together um, recording studios and things like that so that they could actually communicate because 70% of the uh, country in that stage was in subsistence village uh, living and so the only way that they were communicated with by the outside world was either radio programs or they used to send cassette tape machines around which hand crank generators and so these studios were designed to either produce the materials for the broadcasts or for the cassettes. So I, it was really a year after I graduated when I was finally back in Australia that I started to scratch my head and think about how do I get a job. Um, what I did was I got the paper which is what you did in those days. These days you'd go to seek.com and I just had a look at who was asking for people. So I looked at job ads, um, asked people that I knew and um, got a response to three of the ads. So I had three interviews. Um, one of those interviews was with ABC Television. Uh, another one was with a uh, uh, communications company but they're really doing railway signalling called John Connell, Mott Hay and Anderson, sound like lawyers, but they're actually engineers. And I forget who the third interview was with, but um, I didn't like the people and I didn't feel like getting a job with them, so I didn't pursue that one. John Connell, Mott Hay and Anderson made me an offer, so I worked there, uh, learned some really interesting things. And then three months later, ABC Television made me an offer. And so then I switched to what I was more interested in, which was um, so something in the sound or the video area. Um, my experience in Pakistan helped a lot because I'd actually been doing uh, design and commissioning of facilities and so if you like I had some experience that I'd got through my volunteer work that actually helped to answer the question of well yeah but can you do anything practical I know you've got some marks on a piece of paper but what can you actually do if you've got any evidence that you can do engineering work so that sort of gave me something for my resume I did get a lead from one person, so um, and they sent me to a place that stocks nuts, bolts and screws and they're looking for a storeman, so clearly they didn't understand the kind of work I was looking for. Uh, one of the problems is that uh, e engineering is not um, one of the more common professions in Australia. It's a bit different to accountant or doctor or nurse. It, most people know what accountants and doctors and nurses do in general people don't really know what engineers do in general and so it's not easy for them to say oh you should go to this company or to that company unless you've actually been in the industry or you know something about it. I think the difficulty for us as engineers is that we are problem solvers and we're taught to be problem solvers, we're given lots of skills and tools to solve problems with but that ultimately people use products um, and so it was a marketing person who actually told me that the key words for them were always robust and reliable. Not robust and reliable from the engineering calculation perspective, but from the customer's perception of the product. This is where, say, Apple beat Microsoft in terms of perception. Their products are seen as being cool and functional and they work and you know, they're great to engage with. Microsoft products technically often do a lot more things but they're not seen as being as robust or as reliable or as you know, cool to interact with. Um, as engineers, we learn to do the calculations that tell us these are the resistor values you need, these are the power dissipations, this is going to be the temperature rise, this is the circuit board layout, and you've got to be good at all that stuff. So you've got to do your tolerancing, worst case design, failure mode effect analysis, all these things that help you to have a product that really works. But if you forget the end customer, because they're a real stakeholder in this, then 
that's difficult. The hard part is translating that into engineering requirements. It's the translation of what the user wants, so whether it's a road, and obviously the road should last, the bridge should stay up, all these kind of things, how you translate those into engineering requirements. It's that translation function I think where I've learned the most. I think it's the major value that I bring to my clients. I can talk to them in their worldview, then we can translate that into the engineering worldview where we can say these are the volts, these are the amps, this is the power dissipation, this is the speed it's got to be, all of that kind of stuff, um, and then provide them with a product that actually met their user needs. That translation ability, the ability to move between the user's domain and the technical domain, I think is where most of the problems happen in engineering. We don't, I mean, in particular, I see this in software. Um, there's a lot of arguments that software is not really engineering and it's not really science, but the reality is that there are principles like any discipline that you can follow and if you don't follow them then the user gets something that doesn't meet their need, isn't what they ask for and so what you end up with is you end up with an upset user, you end up with an upset engineer or developer and you end up with an upset marketing and commercial department and so you've got a lose-lose-lose scenario. Products that really work end up with a win-win-win scenario. So when you design it, it's a fantastic thing and you enjoy the challenge and you enjoy the outcome. The customer loves the product and it does what they need. It works for the commercial people, it's profitable, it, you know, that kind of stuff. So it's not so much a technical skill, but it's an ability to marry the technical stuff that we've learned and that we keep developing, because you don't learn it all at uni. You do, every day you're learning something new in engineering because you know, the amount of knowledge that can be known is bigger than any one person can hold anyway. So if you're not still learning, then you've actually stopped you know, being creative in, at some levels. And marrying that stuff up with, uh, this is what people need, this is how it works, this is how it fits, that's what actually makes it work for us. Business is people. So if we're talking about professional practice, communication is the number one thing I think we get wrong as engineers. We describe everything in terms of engineering paradigms and we do need to have them in engineering paradigms but marketing people are interested in something different. Production people are interested in something different. Production people don't want to know the calculations that work out the resistor values. They want a process for putting them on the board reliably or they want a process for testing the product reliably. It's communicating with the other stakeholders. So that's part of what I said in the previous answer, is that that ability to translate between the user's domain and the technical domain, and backwards and forwards. Um, there's been a lot of talk in Australia recently, particularly with floods in Queensland and, and you know, west, northwestern Victoria and, and things like that, about they called engineering failures quite often because there wasn't enough drainage or there wasn't enough this or the dam management wasn't properly done. And that's seen as being an engineering problem, uh, and to some degree it is, but it's also a system problem. As engineers, I think we've really failed to engage with the system, all the other stakeholders in the society that we live in, so that we can communicate with them the implications of choices. Financial choices are often made on a, we, that doesn't fit into this budget, so we won't do it at all, as opposed to that's too important to not do, but it might have to wait two years and we will budget for it. Uh, we often produce black and white outcomes. Uh, it's an old, the Greeks did us a great disservice with the concept of true and false because there's a lot of grey. And so as engineers we're very, very comfortable with true and false, in and out. True and false, in and out. That's, that works, that doesn't work. In the real world it's a lot greyer than that. There's a gradation between doesn't work at all and works perfectly. And um, Perception is a really, really important thing. The ability to listen to people and understand what they're actually saying and to communicate back to them so that they understand what you're saying is absolutely vital. I think if we don't do that better as engineers, then we're not going to see the outcomes for society we want because the one difference with engineering is I think it's actually a calling. There's a sense in which people do jobs for money some people say I want to be a doctor because I want to earn a lot of money or I want to be a vet because I want to earn a lot of money. Some people say I want to be a doctor because I really want to help people and work with them. Some people say I want to be a vet because that's, um, it's not as scary as being a doctor.
but it's still quite profitable, you know. And, and but or I love animals and I really want to work with that. I think as engineers, very few people say I'm going to get into engineering so I can become fabulously rich. We get into engineering because we want to change the world. And we want to use our tools and our technical abilities to actually make the world a better place. So to me that has the sense of profession, the sense of calling, the sense of, of, of honour and of duty with it that you don't see in some of the other professions. And for that we're prepared to actually pour ourselves into the task. It's also why we'll actually work for less remuneration and really you know, pour ourselves into jobs sometimes than some of the other professions will. There's an old adage uh, that really smart people don't make good leaders. One of the reasons for that adage is because really smart people know it's complicated and that there are multiple sides to this thing and so they hedge when they're giving opinions and that doesn't create confidence in people. Whereas people who actually aren't that bright sound really confident because they say what they think and they just say, well, this is it. And they sound really confident, they sound like they know what they're doing. And so people follow them. One of, the, um, one of the things about getting promoted as an engineer is that you actually have to ask yourself, what am I trying to do here? What do I want out of this? And how do I have to communicate to get that? Um, we can appear to be wishy-washy or not strong leadership potential people when we just do all the analytical stuff. Uh, to be a good communicator, you've actually got to be confident. You've got to sell the idea. You've got to sell the position. Um, now, selling's got a bit of a bad word with engineers because that's seen as being, you know, the people who go out and misrepresent the product to try and get people to buy it anyway or the marketing idea that, you know, you can charge three times as much for something if you can get the right brand stuck on it, but the underlying technology hasn't changed at all. And so the value proposition seems to be quite ephemeral. Whereas in practice, um, it's no different with us. If I present myself as being not confident, if I present myself as not being sure I want it, if I present myself as being unwilling to make a clear decision, then I'm not going to look like a good candidate as a team leader. I'm not going to look like a good candidate for management who are wanting a clear and concise answer to questions. They don't want to know all the analysis. They want to know, well, what is the best answer? for this problem. Um, so I think this comes back to how we communicate. Understand the forum you're in and the kind of communication you want to do. In, our, in my case, I run a business. Um, I learnt nothing about running a business at engineering school. And most of what I've learned about running a business, I've learned either from working in other businesses and seeing how they did it, or the hard way. Um, I've recently got a business coach because I realised that as a business owner, I still make a very good engineer. And so I need to, as a business owner, be able to look at the business in a different way. Um, owning a business is not like having a job with tax benefits. If you want it to be really, really successful, you actually have to do things differently. So you have to understand financial management. You have to understand at least a bit about brand and position and how people think about stuff. Um, you have to network. In Australia in particular, if you want something, you need to find someone who knows someone who can introduce you because a personal introduction is worth 50 times more than a cold call. If, if you know, Joe says to Tom, hey Tom, I was talking to Ray recently, I think you should have a chat to him. That's, that's a magic moment that gives me an introduction then to have a conversation that is to both of our benefit. If I contact him and say, hi, I'm Ray and I'd like to come and talk to you, then I've got probably a 98% chance of getting a no from almost anyone to that question. So uh, I would say if you want to advance your careers, join the right professional associations, connect yourself with people, um, be part of industry forums, go along to meetings, not just to learn what's happening in the industry, but to meet people. Ultimately, business is people, your career is about who you know and the kind of relationships you've built with them that will allow you to deliver the value that you can inherently bring into the forum that you'd like to contribute it in.